Grace and peace to you, Lavington Vineyard Church. It's great to share the Lord's Supper with you. So two weeks ago in my sermon, I talked about how Jesus and everything about him is at the core of our faith. And then outside of the core, in that next concentric circle, are these historic creeds and confessions that we as a global church have been saying for 1,800 years. And so this morning, just like several times throughout the year, we like to, around the Lord's Supper, share these confessions together. And when we do so, church, we join with millions, if not billions around the world who are uniting our voices and declaring this summary of our faith. So let's do this together. Let's read and recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the grave. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So in light of that historic confession, let's take time to acknowledge our sins together. Up on the screen, you can read as well this prayer of confession along with me. Holy and merciful God, your love is relentless. Yet like the Israelites, we fail to acknowledge you again and again. We have been unfaithful and engaged in our own forms of idolatry. We have lived in lands of corruption and injustice, and too often gone along with what others are doing. We have rejected the knowledge of you and instead made gods of our own ideas. Our hearts are deceitful and prone to wander. But you continue to pursue us, heal us, Forgive us and love us. According to your unfailing love, have mercy on us and forgive us of our sins. Lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you offered that prayer with a sincere heart, know that God forgives you. Know that he wants to restore you and to redeem you. So rest in his grace today. And so now, before we come to take the elements, let's just take 30 more seconds to individually examine our hearts before the Lord. So church family, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Apostle Paul tells us, in fact, the Apostle Paul is just passing along what he received from the Lord, just like I mentioned in the sermon a few weeks ago. But Paul mentions that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. He said, for whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. God, thank you for these gifts. Thank you for these symbols that are not in one way merely just symbols because by your Holy Spirit, in the sacraments, you draw near to us. 
to remind us of this mysterious, beautiful grace displayed in the cross where Jesus gave his life. His body was given for us. His blood was shed to wash us clean. So Lord, would you renew in our hearts the commitment we've made to follow you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello again, church. So a thunderstorm was coming along, so we decided to move inside. So welcome to my living room. So a lot of people, when they use the software Gmail, they use something to improve it even more. So the way that they make it better is they do something called an add-on they install something called an add-on to make what already works pretty well work even better. So you may do it yourself, maybe even with your browser, Chrome, Safari, whatever. You add what's called an extension or an add-on. And so it's taking something that's already working well and just improving upon it. I think that's how a lot of people view God. God is merely an add-on to their life. It could be a life that's already pretty good, So it's just God is a nice addition to an already decent life. Or maybe life is a bit hard. And so God is just added on to see, will this help? Will he help? Will this faith or religion help? Well, so I think what happens is that people use God as a tool for their big life improvement project. And so that God becomes a bit of an afterthought. People pay lip service to God and they do the minimum to get by. Because let's face it, time is precious. And so if God isn't truly precious, then God gets little time, if anything. Also, this ultimately destroys lives. Because what happens is people don't end up relying on God for perseverance in going through trials. Well, then worst of all, people can be dulled into thinking that they're actually a Christian when actually they're not and their soul is in danger. They may think I'm a Christian because I say I am or because I grew up in church or because my parents are or because that's just my culture. But actually, they're not truly born again of the Spirit, as Jesus said. And so this is a big issue for a lot of people, that God just becomes merely an add-on. And so I wonder about you this morning. And if this is you, I wonder if you would consider, and I don't mean to be snarky or sarcastic by this question, but truly for you to consider, how is that actually going for you, if that's true of your life? To have God as an add-on, How is that going for you? Perhaps you think you just don't even have time to consider it. I mean, it just seems like pragmatically, this is just a way of life. It seems to make sense. You know, like God is kind of there when you need him. This may feel like it works most days or weeks or even years, seasons of your life. But there's actually a better way. A way that's not just more helpful, but actually right and true. And the key, church, is to actually involve God in it. That when we are faced with temptation or the reality perhaps in our lives that we've just made God an add-on, then the solution is actually to go to Him, to actually involve Him in addressing this situation. Well, the way that the book of Hosea is calling God's people to address this, is to return to God and to actually do business with God. So, church, we are starting a five-part series in what's called the Minor Prophets. This series is called Majoring on the Minors. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, these minor prophets are not uh, unimportant or less important than the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, but they're minor because these are shorter books. So we're diving today into the book of Hosea and we'll go for these five weeks to see what does God want to say to his people through these prophets and then what would the Holy Spirit want to say to us 
through this ancient inspired text. Well, one of the things we need to say up front is that the prophets can be really strange to read. Now, they're not per prophets in the way we think of, like they're foretelling or foretelling. But they've been sent in this role by God to speak directly to the people about who God is and what God has done and then who the people are as his chosen people, but then what they have done, namely to rebel from him. So much of these prophets, they write in poetry and they're somewhat bizarre characters who are called by God to do these bizarre things. We'll see that directly with Hosea. So they're all in different contexts, different time periods. Hosea is writing fairly early on, and he's writing to the northern kingdom of Israel, probably the only prophet that speaks just directly to Israel before Israel is gone, uh, except for a remnant. But what happens is after Israel divided into Israel in the north, Judah in the south, so much idolatry became rampant, and the kings of Israel in particular were evil and corrupt, and the people were following into the ways of the people of Canaan from the ancient times. Well, in Hosea's context, in that northern kingdom, the key issue is that there was prosperity and simultaneous idolatry. So in many ways, this was a golden age in the 8th century of Israel's history, the 8th century BC. Well, in particular with the idolatry, what was happening was that in addition to the worship of Yahweh that was being lost, now the people were adding on the worship of Baal or Baal who is one of the gods of Canaan. So now, just for them, even though they had been the people of Israel, brought out of Egypt, brought into the promised land to worship the one true God, Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty, they were adding on Baal and worshiping him. So to bridge to our context today, I think what's happening for us, whether you profess to be a Christian or not, whether you're part of a, a Christian culture or nation, so to speak, or not, I think for us in our modern age, what tends to happen is that God becomes an add-on to our modern life, whether your life, you consider it good or bad at the moment. Well, the way that the book of Hosea is calling God's people to address this is to return to God and actually to do business with Him. Well, to do business with Him, there are some things that the, the message of Hosea helps us to understand. And that first thing is that it is a marriage relationship. This relationship with God and his people is like a marriage relationship. So early on in the book of Hosea, God says that I am your husband, not your master. He says, I will betroth you or marry you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. And this just echoes the prophet Isaiah, that great, perhaps the greatest prophet of Israel, where he says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. Hosea's real life, forgiveness to his wife, his forgiving love to his wife Gomer, is meant to reflect God's faithful covenant love to the Israelites. So what did that look like? It looked like that he pursued her. He spoke tenderly to her and he did good to her. I wonder, how do you view God? Do you view him like a cosmic policeman just coming along to enforce the law, to club you over the head when you mess up, when you break the law? Do you view him as mainly a judge Creator, Lord, and Savior. Now, some of those are definitely true. But do you know and realize that the most enduring metaphor is for God as a to, if the metaphor is that God is a lover? It's a picture of one as a lover. It is a marriage relationship. And so if your understanding of the Old Testament in particular is of God as just this creator, judge. And then in the New Testament is where we get all the love. Let the book of Hosea blow that out of the water for you. Because this book, in fact, is soaked in the gospel. And it begins with the declaration that it is a passionate 
love affair. That that's who our God is. Pursuing us and desiring a passionate love affair with his people. So you might be wondering, okay, I I get that this is how Scripture presents God's relationship to his people. But what exactly is the problem? What, What am I supposed to do? Well, this is the second thing that Hosea helps us to understand, and that's that God's people have broken that relationship. So, early on in the book, in fact, the first few verses, we have this introduction of Hosea. And it goes through his lineage, who he is, when he was a prophet, during which times. But the most striking thing that is actually quite shocking and raises lots of questions for us is that God called him to marry a promiscuous woman named Gomer and to marry her in love and show love to her and to be faithful to her. But sadly, even after they had three children, Gomer became unfaithful again and she went off with various lovers. And so we are to see this picture, this real life tragic picture that happened to Hosea in history as a symbol for what was happening with God and his people. And so just as Gomer was unfaithful to Hosea, so Israel has been unfaithful. You could call chapters one to three. You could put a heading, faithful Hosea and his faithless wife. And then chapters four to 14, faithful God and his faithless people. So that faithlessness was manifested first in the personal. And that's that there was a lack of acknowledgement of God. That across the board, people were not acknowledging God. And eight times in these 14 chapters, some form of this word acknowledge is there. So it's this this idea of not just knowing God, but actually seeking Him. That's what acknowledge would mean, but they were not doing it. So they're breaking the first commandment, right? Because they were going after other gods. So that first commandment to love the Lord your God, to have no other gods before him. They were breaking that and that was leading to breaking all of the others. And just throughout Hosea, if you go and read it, you'll just see him list these things out. So they had deserted the Lord and engaged in spiritual prostitution. They had rebelled against the Lord, but what happened is before it got to their actions, it started in the heart. Hosea says that their hearts were deceitful. Their hearts were rebellious. And one manifestation was this arrogance in the rebellion and the falsehood and the idolatry. Well, through Hosea, the Lord says in chapter 11, My people are determined to turn from me. Listen to that. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. I wonder if you're someone who's good at throwing around religious jargon, religious language. Maybe if you were to get up in front of the church, whether it's on a video like this during a pandemic or in the future physically, that you'd be able to get up really easily and say, praise God, maybe even praise God again. But I wonder if then you would turn from that go off the rest of the week and just live in complete denial of that profession. You would go off and join in corruption and rebellion against God. Even though they call me God most high, or we could say, even though they say, praise God, praise God again, he will not exalt those just empty words if they're not backed up by how we live our lives. Well, then beyond the personal is the societal. That the nation of Israel that Hosea is preaching to has become corrupt and they are unjust. Corruption and injustice fills the land. The poor are oppressed. And worst of all, the most vulnerable in society, children were actually being sacrificed and Baal worship. Just as God had warned them about centuries before, it was now happening. It had gotten that bad. Now, at one point in Hosea's uh, poetry, 
He says that Israel cries out and acknowledges God, but they've rejected what is good. So it's not just enough to acknowledge God, like with those empty words, or even with, with a heart that's like, ah, okay, God, I acknowledge you. But yet, if it's not backed up by how we actually live our lives. Hosea is saying to the people, there is hypocrisy in the land. And it was rampant throughout Israel. So they had the breaking of the Ten Commandments, the summary of God's moral law, and then rampant injustice. And it was hypocritical because they would break the law, they would just do all kinds of injustice, and then they would go off and offer sacrifices. Well, of course, on top of that, as an add-on for them, they would go and sacrifice to Baal as well. So that's a stark picture of the idolatry in Hosea's context. But what about us? Part of the difficulty of bridging from the context of Hosea and the whole Old Testament to us is we think, God, I just can't relate to that kind of idolatry. So what does idolatry really mean? So I think for us, even if we, if we leave aside the bad stuff, the stuff that we know is bad that we are tempted by and get into, but even some good things in our lives, when those good things become God things, we know it's idolatry. Another way to think of it is that when we say, Jesus is really great, but what I really need is fill in the blank. Whatever you fill in that blank with, that's idolatry. That's your idol. And so for you, maybe it's work. Maybe it's family, sex and romance or hobbies or whatever it is that in and of itself can actually be a good thing, is a good thing, a gift from God. But when that good thing becomes a God thing, that's idolatry. So let me ask you, do you even acknowledge God most days? Do you go multiple days without even acknowledging God's existence? Like, yeah, in your heart of hearts, you know He's there. You, you, you kind of have a relationship with Him, but you can go days without even acknowledging His existence, let alone His presence in your life. In Hosea 12, 5 to 6, there's this call to wait and to trust in the Lord. Because maybe for you, part of why this is so hard to acknowledge God and to pursue a relationship with Him is because life is just really hard. I mean, the distractions are just like the drudgery, the trials, the suffering even, of life. So listen to God's word in Hosea 12. He says, The Lord God Almighty, the Lord is his name, but you must return to your God. Maintain love and justice, and listen to this, and wait for your God always. Maybe for you, the waiting is the most difficult thing. And so in the struggle that you're facing, Maybe you just, you just give up on the waiting and you say you resort to a different kind of worldview. We say, God, life is so hard right now. You're not coming through for me. So it must be that someone cursed me. That's why I can't get my job, why I can't pay my rent, why I'm having relational difficulty. Is that someone must have cursed me somewhere. Or you go to a witch doctor to say, Something needs to change. I got to try something because God is just not coming through for me. Well, maybe for you from a different worldview, it's like you're looking inside yourself to define your identity and your purpose because God just doesn't seem to be coming through. And the world in this modern, especially Western world is telling you, you are the one who defines your life and gives yourself meaning and purpose. And then you need to express that to the world. And here Hosea is calling us back, calling God's people and through the centuries, the Holy Spirit saying to us as well, return to your God, maintain love and justice and wait for your God always. Well, at this point, perhaps you're thinking, okay, wow, God's people have really messed up this relationship. So what is God's response? What is he going to do? 
Well, here, if you have, if you don't know the full story and you have an expectation of judgment at this point, well, that's partly true. At this point, if God had just brought complete judgment, he would have been good and just to do that. I wonder if you think that God owes you anything. Does God owe you anything? Friends, God doesn't owe us anything. But actually, He does owe us something, and that is judgment and death. The Apostle Paul says clearly that the wages of sin is death. And yet, and yet there's good news. God didn't just stop there. The third truth that Hosea shows us is that God radically longs to restore that relationship. The only thing we deserve from God is judgment and death, and yet He offers us everything in the gospel. All the riches of the kingdom, all the spiritual and long-term final material riches of the kingdom are ours. And so He radically longs to restore that relationship. And His love is expressed as a loving Father who is tender. He speaks tenderly to His people, Hosea says. He will pursue his people and restore them. Listen to what chapter 11 says. God says, my heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. Doesn't that seem like a strange word choice for the inspired prophet to make? All my compassion is aroused, God says through Hosea. That's not just a throwaway word. There's actually deep meaning there because for a people who had gone to the worship of Baal, where along with child sacrifice were all kinds of prostitution rituals and all kinds of fertility rituals around this false god, Baal. And so in the nation of Israel, endorsed by the, the kings and snubbed by the, the priests themselves, all kinds of sexual deviance. So in that context, God is saying, all my compassion is aroused that even as they are going to these things, God longs for relationship with his people to be restored. Near the end of the book, even after all these pronouncements of judgment, all these accusations, the reality of what the people were doing, near the end, the promises of healing and forgiveness and love. Now at this point in the book, when you really get deep into the book and you soak in this real life story that Hosea had to live out, imagine a conversation between Hosea and his sister. As once again, she sits and listens to Hosea weeping, and lamenting the unfaithfulness of his wife. And by the way, just a quick side note, as we read the prophets and when we come to different genres of scripture, we need to understand how to read them. So please understand that when we read something like the prophets, Hosea is not a book about marriage advice, okay? This is not a book meaning to say what needs to happen in a broken marriage. But in the real life experience of marriage, where yes, we can learn from especially God's heart to his people, the main issue for Hosea's marriage to Gomer is how it mirrors what's happening with God and his people. But imagine you're overhearing that conversation with Hosea and his sister. And she's saying to Hosea, Hosea, like, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. This is pathetic. She has just gone after other lovers time and time again. She is pathetic. This is pathetic. You, Hosea, are pathetic. And that's what we're confronted with in this book. Where God's radical, covenant, faithful love is so radical that it feels scandalous, church. It almost seems pathetic how radical it is. And it's especially radical and seemingly scandalous to ears and hearts to, from our own nature, our religious ears religious hearts 
that would want to say, God, you, only, you should only welcome back people that perform, people that obey, people that earn their way back to you. But oh, what we see throughout this gospel-soaked Old Testament book is God saying, I will pursue my people. I have a radical love for them. And we see this displayed most of all, sisters and brothers in Christ, in Jesus Christ himself, that he brought to fulfillment this love of God. And he showed us most clearly. So Hosea is like taking a huge arrow and pointing straight to Christ. So beginning in chapter one, Judah and Israel will have one leader. One leader. That's Christ. Jesus becomes the fulfillment of that promise. And then in chapter three, it says that Israel will return to God and David their king. David their king. I mean, he died a couple hundred years before. How, how could he become their king? How could they return to him? Well, of course, it's talking about the greater David, the son of David who is to come, Jesus born in Bethlehem. And then Hosea chapter 13 near the end. Paul picks up on this in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says that because of Jesus, death has been conquered. That last enemy to be defeated, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The conqueror has come. So we've seen how God's relationship with his people is like a marriage relationship. We have broken that relationship. But God radically longs to restore that relationship. So let me ask you, do you actually love God? Do you love Him? Or is He just merely an add-on to your life, however good, however bad you think your life is? I wonder if you're listening to that and you hear that question, you just think, Jeremy, is that really what the Christian life is about? I mean, I know I've heard that before, that you know this is about a love and a relationship with God, but are you sure you're not just being a sentimental American here? I mean, all this ooey-gooey talk of a passionate love affair, a love relationship with God? Friend, He loves you too much to be an add-on. And if you think that, Jeremy, isn't isn't faith and religion mostly about just being a respectable person, just being a good citizen? I have mostly a record of good deeds that outweigh my bad deeds. You know, it's just obeying. I mean, isn't that really what it's about? I would just bring to your mind the words of Jesus himself, where he tells this parable to his disciples and to anyone listening where at the end of time, people would come to him and say, Lord, Lord, look at all these things that we've done in your name. We've cast out demons. We have prophesied. We have done exploits, as people say. And the jarring reality is that what he will say in response to them is, I never knew you. Depart from me. He doesn't say, you didn't obey me or you turned away from me. Although that would be true. But he says to those people, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. The heartbeat of God is to know and to be known. Our God who for all eternity has been a community, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so I want to invite you, sisters and brothers, whoever is listening, to respond to this message of Hosea by doing something incredibly practical. And that is in the next month, I want to challenge you to go on a walk with God and have a define the relationship talk. It's what in my culture we call a DTR. I actually forgot to ask if this happens in Kenya, if you have DTRs. But in my culture in the U.S., people who are dating, or even a lot of times a married couple, at various points will have a DTR, define the relationship. How are we doing? 
And so wherever you are in your heart of hearts, knowing that our hearts can lie to us or deceitful, but to be honest with yourself, wherever you are with the Lord, to go on that walk sometime in the next month. Hosea 14.2 says, take words with you and return to the Lord. So go and talk to him. If you can get to Karura Forest or the Arboretum or somewhere in nature where if possible you avoid distraction, silence your phone or leave it at home, take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. So go to him with those words. Now, maybe this is a struggle for you to confront the state of your relationship with God. Maybe you just feel let down by God because so much harm has been done in your life that you've experienced real trial and suffering to a degree that it's been even debilitating for you. And maybe for you, someone has written across your life those names that were given to Gomer and Hosea's children. Names that mean deserving of punishment, not loved, not my people. Maybe those words have been written across the pages of your life. But I wonder if you could imagine Jesus taking a red pen and writing over those words in red ink. Deserving of punishment? Okay, yeah but forgiven and reconciled. Not loved? No, loved before the foundation of the world. Not my people? No, adopted and precious. You're mine. A few weeks ago, my family and I had the privilege of visiting the beach, going to the coast. And at this hotel where we would eat dinner, just steps away from a beautiful beach, It was interesting sitting there as a family and there's different families all around us. And so you see some of the same people do a little bit of people watching. So I confess I happened to notice one couple in particular. That for every meal they came to, for virtually the entire meal, the the woman, the wife, had her smartphone in her hand and then holding her fork or spoon with the other one. And the only time she would put it down is when she went to the buffet to get more food, but she would come back and immediately pick up her phone. And I noticed this meal after meal, day after day. And her husband would sit across from her and occasionally he would pick up his phone, maybe not knowing what to do. Occasionally she would comment on something on her phone and they would have a short conversation. You could tell I was (laughs) noticing a little bit. But he would often just sit there and kind of stare off almost like he didn't know what to do. And I sat there and just thought, this is so sad. It actually looked so pathetic. So maybe that's you. Could it actually be because of a smartphone or just entertainment? That as you sit there, so to speak, at a table with your God, with your God who loves you, that you are distracted you're sitting there distracted by whatever it is in your life and you're paying no attention to him. And he's sitting across and see, unlike that real life husband that we saw who from time to time would pick up his own phone or just not know what to do. Your lover is staring across the table with longing in his eyes, desperately wanting relationship with you. He's not distracted but he's laser focused on loving you. In the book of Hosea, there are 30 I wills spoken by God through Hosea. And so just a taste of those. He says, I will allure. I will speak comfort. I will give. I will make covenant. I will marry you to me. I will marry you to me forever. I will marry you to me in loving kindness. I will hear. I will have mercy. I will say you are mine. I will be your king. I will ransom you from the power of the grave. I will heal your backsliding. I will love you freely. 
Let's pray. Lord, I want to pray for those right now who have never truly loved you. Lord, maybe they're coming to realize right now, maybe they've been around church their whole life, maybe around LVC for a couple years, but are now through this word, realizing that they've never actually known you because they're confronting the fact that they don't actually love you. Oh Lord, by your good news, would you draw them to faith and repentance? Would you help them to reach out and talk to someone about what this realization means and how they can come to know you? Lord, I pray for those who have truly known you. Lord, it may be in university or high school or sometime when they were younger, they were passionately in love with you. But then in the rat race of life, their love has grown cold. They've become distracted. They've lost that passion that they had. God, I pray that you would be like that lover across the table. Lord, that they would put down their phone or whatever distraction and look into your eyes and see your love and receive your forgiveness and grace. Lord, wherever we are, God, give us the boldness, the courage, the discipline to make time for this walk with you, to create that space, to come before you and say, Lord, how are we doing? Lord, thank you for your amazing, scandalous love. And we pray this in Jesus, the name of the one who revealed that love most clearly. Amen. Love you, church. We'll see you later.